Right, Arcanus, let's get going. Right, uh, there we go. Let's put the mouse on the right button and we're in business. Five attendees so far, hopefully we get some more dropping in as other um, sessions finish and people get their cups of coffee sorted. Uh, hello, welcome to track four, session six, uh, Tells the Trenches. Um, just the usual housekeeping. I'm sure everyone knows all this already. Please adhere to the code of contract. Be aware, welcoming, friendly, open, understanding and kind. All the things we do all the time at DDD events. Uh, a reminder, please donate. If you've got just a couple of quid spare, the National Museum of Computing is a really worthy cause um, and certainly deserves our support. And our sponsors, all of these including Landmark, who I work for, uh, NDC who have given away golden tickets, Black Marble who run it, and Sage who have um, sponsored, I think, every single DDD ever. Um, they will sp um, sponsor DDD by donating to the National Museum of Computing, which is really good. The Twitter hashtags DDD 2021 and Developer Day. Um, feel free to tweet out, let people what you're doing. Let's raise awareness of this set of events because DDD events are really, really central to our community here in the UK. OK. So the proper intro, we're into the real slides now. Um, for those of you that, that may or may not know me, my name is Joel Hammond Turner. Uh, I was a technical lead uh, Landmark Information Group uh, working on a legacy product, which is where this talk has come from. Contact details are on the slide. Um, I'm no longer a technical lead. Um, I'm now their chief solutions architect, which was very nice for me. Uh, but means I get to see even more legacy code. Um, just a reminder, um, it's in the, so in the sponsors channel we are recruiting. There's a so please come and talk to me if you're really interested. We do a lot of really cool stuff on top of our legacy code. So to frame this talk, um, when I was coming up with the title, I came up with the title first and coming up with what to talk about, there were just too many possibilities. Um, in any legacy code base, you will find all sorts of skeletons in the closet. This is just a few of the ones um, I wanted to call out and the approaches to, I took to try and fix them. Um, but there will be many more. Uh, I'll take questions as we go in the Discord. Um, and Nigel, uh, a producer, will triage them, so here's, he, what he'll do is any that we should deal with right away because they'll clarify something I've said, he'll butt in. Uh, otherwise, there's a quick Q&A session at the end. But chuck your questions on the Discord and let's get going. So about two years ago, I moved teams from um, one part of Landmark into another. Um, and I was a bit worried. It looked like it was a bit of a sideways push. Uh, oh, let's put him away from the real action. Uh, this team had been very busy. The product was very successful, making a lot of money. It was very much a cash cow. Um, but I was the third tech lead on that team in three years. And so, yeah, legacy code bases just aren't sexy. And so I worried about that. Um, to put, the, put it there, this code base is about a million lines of code. It's got a 30 year history of development. There was a brilliant idea right at the beginning. It's been developed and developed. It's a market leader in a lot of, in a lot of senses. But as soon as I got into the team, I started finding that there was little red flags coming up. And one of the key one is not a single one of the original developers or even the developers who work with the original developers, or even a developer that had worked with one of the developers who had once upon a time worked with an original developer, were left in the team. This shouldn't be a problem, but this is a legacy code base. Of course, that means 
there's a little bit of trepidation when you move into that million lines of code. And the second part was just a split personality in the product. There was a core product that did all the behaviors, and all the, um, it was all the code. And then there was a whole load, and in fact, a whole team generating effectively UI and scripts completely independently, which was interpreted by the core product. And that meant that was converted deployment processes, really weird um, disjoints between the code and the database and the script releases. This split personality was, again, a real product. This is probably, a, I felt right up front, was a bit of a product in peril. So what was it? It was really, really traditional. Still is, it hasn't, hasn't been rewritten yet. It's on its way. It was a fat, really fat WinForms client. You know, 100,000 plus lines of code in the WinForms client. It was a really ugly, traditional ASP, um, ASP.NET web service based server layer where everything went through ASMX files. Those are lovely in themselves. And under the hood was a database with SQL Server, a SQL Server database, mostly fairly straightforward, apart from those 40 or 50 tables, which had four or 500 columns in them, and occasionally would grow by 100 columns at a time. <clears throat> and you can, you can immediately see, when you start seeing those sort of structures, this hasn't had an awful lot of love over the years. It's been built out, rinse and repeat, do the same as we always did, just to get the delivery done. So my first introduction to this was really simple. My, my product owner said, great, we're in the middle of just tarting up the UI, his words, not mine. Um, actually, the project was called Project Lipstick. I leave you to understand the connotations of that. And it was, we just need to change these traditional buttons to something a little bit slicker and more modern because that'll really improve the product. Our customers will feel loved because we were up doing a big update. And this will lead into some other work we're doing just to, to restructure it a little bit to make it more usable. Simple, basic um, polish and usability stuff. Yeah, let's just change some buttons. Fine, I'll go in. I can see we're using infragistics ultra buttons in a load of places, so I'll change the infragistics style. Tick, job done, that'll be easy. Of course, because it wasn't just using infragistics buttons. It had its own buttons, custom buttons, buttons from other platforms. It had infragistics buttons that weren't actually styled by the infragistics styling system. And so this change the buttons what should have been a five minute fix ended up being likely to be weeks and weeks of work. This is when I really realized as the technical lead, I've got to jump in here. I'm going to have to be really bullish. and I'm going to have to take the problem and hit it head on and actually do the right thing. So in this scenario, what I did, I created my own button that inherited from the infragistics button that did all the right stuff, looked, looked perfect in all scenarios, and I replaced every single instance of every single button in that 200,000 lines of code in the client. And it worked. It was rather more work than I wanted to do. It was rather less work than changing every single button because of the legacy. That was the symptoms. That was the, that was the first thing that introduced me to this and where I knew this was a bit of a product in peril. And I could see the symptoms coming out when I was talking to the, to the um, team. The first one to spot, really obvious, this was a fear of change to the code base. Everything was, well, it's going to take me a couple of weeks to work out how to do this. It's going to take me, oh, several days just to, to understand what the changes are going to be. And these were comparatively small changes in the Lipstick project. Let's also put it into context this lipstick project had been going for six months before I joined. It was supposed to be it's supposed to be a four week project. The other thing was obvious was how many files and lines of code were being changed for really, really what should be really small things. 
how long it was taking to make small changes. This is all relevant because it was all an indicator that I needed to see that there were problems. OK. Unsurprisingly, there was an extensive backlog. I'm looking at the time and think I need to move on a bit of here. The last real major gotcha was this onboarding process. It would take two weeks for someone to actually get to the point where they could run everything locally, understand it enough to make even a small textual change, just finding stuff. And there was custom implementations up and down the stack, which really confused people. Specifically, had its own thread, low level thread pool based threading model with a whole library of implementations and everything used it. So through those first couple of weeks, my what the what the bleep per minute rate was really, really high. And it took a quite a long time for it to go down. And even now, I'll still go in and look at some of the code and just go, please, really? It's technically you have to go back and think about these things and make the decisions of how to what you need to address to push forward. And the first one was a, was a real biggie for us. It was a huge problem. It was a legacy. What am I talking about? I'm actually talking about something that falls out really naturally of the traditional structure of a WinForms app. It's because where WinForms has come from, even the current templates do this. A traditional WinForms app has a program.cs, you know, effectively a command line application that news up a main form, which may in turn new up various bits of UI within it. And then all the events are baked into those classes for the user, for the user controls, the, view, the, the views effectively. The problem is because the templates knew everything up and the static void main at the top, the MSTA thread, it kind of gets you into the habit of, oh, if um, everything's everything hangs off of program and main form, everything links to it. The problem comes where you need to interact with something that's outside of your scope. And almost universally, when I've seen a WinForms app, at some point you'll get an app help. So when a case detail tab, for example, needs to tell the main form something, close me or close, you know, the easiest way to do it is to set up an app, a static app helper that gets a link to the main form that the main form sets, and then other instance classes, the UI, can call that and get behaviors to happen. That's actually straightforward. Static behaviors aren't necessarily a bad thing, even in a WinForms app. And an abstraction of a set of behaviors into a helper class is not a bad thing for a WinForms app. The problem that more often than not, lots of things will start hooking in to main form. And then because it's there, the app helper will hook into other classes as well. Classes will register themselves with the app helper so that other things can talk to them. This should be where this would traditionally in .NET Core and WPF particularly be where dependency injection comes in. And then you suddenly get even more things hooking in so you refactor them, so you've got a different helpers, but these are still static God objects. They still sit, sit there and do nothing. These are where your elder gods live. So how to approach it? You've got to look at the one place where really everything comes out of the main form, because that's the class that's newed up by the program right at the beginning. And I'm going to very quickly show you some code. I'm going to just jump into Visual Studio over here. I'll find it. I'll also find the correct Visual Studio. Uh, that's completely wrong. The wrong project. So let's get rid of program, that one there. So this WinForms project, I'll put this is in GitHub. I'll make the link available. I renamed a couple of things. The host is the program.cs, and here's the line where I set up my static instance where my static thread runs the application and my shell which is my main form which i shouldn't have double clicked on because that opens the designer we really don't want to wait for the designer 
Let's view the code instead. We'll always have an analyzed component to set itself up, which is code gened out of the designer. And links up to events. Now this particular one, if I run it, you'll see I'm assigning the God object in there. So it hangs up. This one actually has a couple of sub controls. This particular user control here has a button which links back to close the app. How does it link back to close the app? Well, unsurprisingly, because this is a demonstration of it, uh, your code, I call God object dot main form dot close. And here's my static God object, which provides my references. And I was this code base had that everywhere. It's really horrible to, to pull to pieces. So let's get rid of those. And I'm just going to quickly highlight the fact you can fix the problem. So I'm going to jump to a different thread. So now, if you are careful, and this is a good, this is a referencing a reference implementation of this, you can actually use the .NET Core Styly host builder to set up a host to run your application. And this host, which in this case is, is so there's a static method for the entry and it's an instance class of itself that runs itself. Can now you take a shell, same class, just abstracted via its constructor. Benefit then, of course, is that the shell itself can now take, can now be created via dependency injection and use bits and bobs. The shell can expose itself as a, the I shell interface can expose a main form through itself, very straightforward. And that means that our view back here can be changed to actually take a shell by dependency injection. You think that's brilliant, it's going to work perfectly. No, it's not. Because it's still wind forms, you're still going to jump through hoops because probably the views are always going to, are always going to be created via um depend uh, via being newed up from a uh, code gen view but there is a little tweak you can do with lazy instantiation and a very simple service locator pattern that means now instead the button click there is <coughs> i'm going to close my reference to the shell and that is injected it does exactly the same thing, but I've gotten rid of this God object that doesn't exist, has no, there's nothing there, and I'm relying on dependency injection to jet to new up the thing I want. So that's just a quick demo of you can get around these things because I've got a better time. So, slaying Cthulhu, how do we move this forward? So this one, the God objects, you've got to identify the worst offenders. Pick the pick the one right at the top. In that case, in the case of most Windows um, forms apps, that's going to be the main form. Get in there and uh, look and see what that is doing because it's going to be doing way more than it should be. You've got to extract behaviors into services. You need to understand what those are. Put them into a service, make them injectable, and actually then you'll get a much more structured, much more modern code base very, very quickly. Particularly, we had a half dozen behaviors within the main form to do with file watching and um, network watching that actually go really bad well into hosted services in the ASP.NET, the, the, the .NET Core style hosting model. And we've seen you can inject factories, use inject services in DI. If you use lazy factories, you can get around the problem of views setting themselves up. So the second piece, there's only three in this, I want to talk about was a big mad problem that we discovered. So when I was setting this talk up, I did want to originally talk about 
spaghetti code. Specifically, we've I mentioned we've got this problem of there's the core code and these scripted UI workflows. And in the core code, there was a whole bunch of classes that kind of referenced each other, sometimes via God objects, but mostly were invoked when something happened, when you wanted to display the, the, the baiting UI from these externally developed workflow scripts. And there was an engine and it called Invoker and there were handlers and dispatchers to, to interact with the UI and macro invokers. The problem is the macro invokers actually invoked script again. So it's very circular and very, very stack heavy. Um, the other gotcha in there is try catches everywhere to, to, to write code C like rather than C sharp like. That wasn't really much of a problem except the, the single responsibility principle had gotten lost and all those were going all over the place. So I was going to talk about that, but I then realized there was something even more underhand and pernicious in the code base that's a much more interesting thing to talk about because that's straightforward, it's breaking up, it's refactoring. And that was, there were some surprises that when I really least expected it. And I'll be interested to see if anyone spots the surprise in this slide uh, in the Discord. And this started when I realized, when I was looking through the source code, having just cloned it, and found a load of DLLs. These are the actual DLLs. So there's two problems here. One, we've got DLLs in in uh, source in our source code repository, so they're in source under source control, which is generally a bad thing anyway. Second was some of these are third-party DLLs. Now this project was built up when NuGet didn't even exist, so it's hardly surprising that you want to put your dependencies somewhere where you don't have to copy them in manually and they can be part of the build process. That's kind of OK. But here we're looking at not only third party DLLs, but manually created interop DLL, C sharp interop DLLs, and DLLs that were built out of some of our build tools that have been put in them that have been accidentally copied in and put into source control. So deleting these would be straightforward. The problem is not there. The problem is actually to do with the references. So this is a traditional C sharp code base. So it's not SDK style, it's old style CS project files. That means actually it's really hard sometimes to work out what the dependencies are. And it's really easy for references to get balked. Specifically, we found that reference it, that the client would reference the client core and reference the framework. That's straightforward. But those some of those references were coming out of the wrong folders. They weren't coming out of, they weren't being direct references to the right place. If you're building the projects up within a single solution, the, the, the reference tree was wrong. They got it had been even worse though. For whatever reason, they decided that when they're building the project, they would configure every single project to build into the same folder, a top level bin folder that was actually in the in the folder above the solution folder. This means you end up with different solutions depending on each other's code, which may be correct in the, without having you get there to, to, to deal with it. But where they pull those DLLs from can be completely random. This just became a total nightmare. The solution, which hasn't been completed yet, is to move to SDK projects. You know, if your project reference is great, new get dependencies, brilliant. DLLs in the source repository, not good. Cross solution references, appalling. Single build, single build folders, appalling. The solution is one that hasn't been implemented yet because it's a big, laborious process, and that's 
Go to SDK projects, use NuGet packages wherever you can, package your own code up into a NuGet package in a private repo so you can reference it properly across solutions. Got to do that. That, of course, then threw up an even nasty problem. As we're doing this, we're updating all the NuGet packages. Brilliant, great, fine. Everyone here, I'm sure, will have hit the problem of updating system.net.http under, under .NET 472, and then realizing that something depends on an earlier version, and you get a binding redirect error when you try and write the code. Those binding redirect errors are just bloody horrible. But there's a solution. Way back into the beginning of .NET Core, you can whack in a redirect to fix conflicts. Binding redirect, brilliant. And that tells the runtime on startup to, to redirect 0.1.2 to 5.6.4. Very straightforward. And actually, the new get packaging system for non SDK projects will build those up automatically in a lot of cases. Newtonsoft, good example. You always get Newtonsoft binding redirects injected all over the shop. Package up updates, project references will always cause these at some point. And then you, they're usually quite straightforward to find and fix. Fusion log is always your friend here. We have a slightly more convoluted problem. At some point in the past, someone has decided that because the fat Windows client was being deployed onto customers' machines, and don't even get me started about the update and deployment process for that, because that's a whole other, another horror story. Um, they decided that actually it would be a bad thing for customers to have to manage, or for us to have to manage, an app config alongside the executable. So they removed it. App configuration came out of other places. It wasn't needed. Don't need, we don't need an app config anymore. Why should we? We don't ship it, we don't want it, don't need it. Our update process doesn't support it. So that meant we couldn't actually use binding redirects when we broke the client by doing a system net HTTP library update. That was fun, particularly as, it, particularly as of course, even the testers, when they ran it local, when they ran a, a, a local copy, yeah, it kind of worked. It was only when we started putting it through the updater process and the release process that we caught it. Fortunately, we caught it at UAT. And the, the client just wouldn't work. It wouldn't even start. And because of the pattern of let's suppress exceptions and just log something and return zero to the user, double clicking to start the application, it just didn't start. So this comes on to a really fun piece. Um, which is almost uh, just me having a little bit of fun, which is there is a way around this. It took me a while, to, a while to find it, but you can actually, I'll flip to different Visual Studio here. You can actually hook into the assembly binding um, handlers by app domain, current domain, assembly resolve. You can put in your own handlers here which means you can actually say, okay, if I know I'm resolving a particular library, I can do the binding redirecting code. And this is the code you need. You add a handler, you pick the assembly name, you get a tar target version, and it comes back. What this, this little helper does, redirect assembly, is just adds all those handlers. When the handler's actually run and done and got a redirected assembly, it can remove itself because the domain will then manage the assembly redirect from there. And you can write this sort of code here. Right, can say system three and task extensions, just redirect everything to 4201. Now what's interesting is that this code here. We've now re we actually did this with a tool, a handwritten tool. You can now actually create a source generator, and I know there's a session on source generators coming up here, 
that will also generate the code needed, this code here, for your application. It reads your app config, generates some code in the background, and then will apply it. So for your code, you end up, and yes, this is Visual Studio 19, doesn't support the, the tooling properly yet. You add in something to get the code generator to happen. You call your binary redirects or apply method. And you end up having effectively binding redirects in code. That solved a huge problem for us because otherwise we were looking at a massive job of rewriting the updater and the installer, which was so out of scope, it wasn't true. This code is also on my GitHub, and I'll put the link in the Discord later. OK. So to do with references, this madness of references. Just say no to DLLs and source control. You don't need them. You can't have them. They're just always going to be a millstone around your neck. And in fact, anything that's not a package or a project reference needs to be gone. If you've got cross solution DLL references, you're going to need to start putting some you get custom you get packages in there. Do migrate to the SDK project format files as soon as you can, because they make such a difference. Legacy code will inevitably have those somewhere in there. And that's a, such a big step forward, it's untrue. And the approach we did with that was actually not even using any migration tools, but renaming the project file, putting a boilerplate in, in place of it, and then fixing everything until it all compiles and ran. That way you at least guarantee to get rid of any rogue references and spot them because you'll have to generate the references yourself. It's laborious, but it does have a huge impact and is a really big bonus for moving forward. And finally, yes, binding read effects don't have to be painful. There are ways around them. There are ways to all code gen them and also gen them. So that was our second tale from the trench. You know, references being horrible. The third one is kind of related. And that's why traditional configuration manager is a curse and why it can create a bit of a curse in your code base. So configuration manager is a very straightforward thing. It's a static class that reads app config and lets you expose connection strings and key value pairs for your settings so you can plug them into your features, which is fine. Works really easily, very easy to spot. It's totally trivial to implement. Everyone knows how to do it, except you end up with magic strings everywhere. Even if you collapse those into um, constant strings somewhere, there's, there's, there's still the string in the app config and the string in the code base. Which is always going to be a problem. And you end up finding a configuration manager is referenced all over the place. Um, one of these references copied around was system configuration or configuration manager. It was all over the shop. But what it also does is because it's quite easy to do, there's all there's a tendency, and we suffer this, to decide that, well, actually, yes. Rather than have every class talking to the configuration manager directly, I'll have a configuration class that proxies, proxies it and lets the feature talk to the configuration class, which reads configuration. If that were injected, brilliant. But of course, this is a legacy project. It's a static. What it does do, this construct does do, of course, is it lets you put your settings somewhere else. And this is exactly where we needed where the previous piece came in about not having an app config. But that was fine because we had code that would load settings from a registry and inject them into our configuration class. Or load settings from a database once we connect, once we'd authenticated and set them into our configuration class. Brilliant. Except it's still a singular configuration. It's still a static. It's another God object. So how do we answer this one? Well, Microsoft has already done it for us. Our problem is applying it. And that's, of course, our options pattern in Microsoft.extensions.configuration. And that's where you break things out. 
you use the extension class that can read via whatever providers you like, custom ones or default ones. And then that can provide actually an individual configuration. That, that means that you'll rather than have one big class, which is the temptation that, that all the features use, each feature, feature understands only the config it needs. And we use dependency injection to pick those up. And that's exactly what we've started doing. We've started removing the custom config things out of the custom configuration into something that's really targeted. And we found actually we've generated 40 or 50 config files, config classes already, because so many things only need this one app config line or this one piece of the registry and don't need it from anywhere else. This actually has given us a feature for the future that's going to be hugely significant as we move forward. And this is one of the things you can do to get your product owners to say, to do the work to refactor this sort of thing. Yes, it's a horrible code style. It's a nasty piece of thing. It's very convoluted. It makes it difficult to work on, but if you can give them a carrot, as I did, then suddenly this becomes a feature not tech debt. And the feature is actually down to um, a piece of technology from Azure called Azure App Configuration. And it integrates with um, Microsoft.extensions.configuration and ultimately means that you end up with only needing one thing in App Config or wherever we registry or wherever you get it from. And then all the other configuration comes down the pipe from Azure. It's very similar to launch darkly, but with a few extra bells and whistles that make it particularly useful for our use case. So the key value pay, pair configuration is good. It does feature switches really well, which means you can allow features to be enabled for one user on, on all of them. It's a central place, so that means your support people can change our customer's configuration remotely. That's a win. And even better from a security perspective, if you've got secrets for connections to services, those can be put in Key Vault. So they've got rotation and all those that good stuff all out of the box, and you don't have to worry about talking to Key Vault with a Key Vault client. That got rid of our a whole load of code well, that will get rid of a whole load of code from our code base anyway. So that's predicated though on you've got you have to configuration in place. So I'll show a little bit of code now, which just to show you how easy it is to set up. And actually, that is the code in the sample code base, which I'll bring up here. There's another application down here that awaits you, which is here. Now this little sample doesn't quite work yet. I've done this before and I have got it working, but this I haven't had a chance to just find the one little bit of magic that makes it automatically update itself. You can actually tell, set up your configuration to use as your app configuration. I've got one connection string. So I'm actually getting out of user secrets. So my connection string to my Azure app config just doesn't, won't exist in, the, in GitHub, which is great. That's what I want. And I can go in and I can say, I'm going to refresh all the things if app config .app version changes. And I'll refresh all the configuration I get from Azure. And then because we're actually adding it into the config for the app configuration, that then means that it just gets injected via the usual I options of app config in this case. It's a very simple um, piece of code. This one just takes 
an options monitor of my config and we'll dump it. So for this example, I register down here the config printer service of app config. So that'll just print the print the value of app config as we go. So if we just quickly bob to Azure, 40 minutes in, here's the app config. Go to configuration explorer. You see, I've got app config app version, which is currently set to I set it to at one point that DVD 2021. I'll just apply that. This connection is the one that this app we use. So if I run this app, oops, no, let's not do that. Let's run this app. What are you doing? Yep. So this one starts a project. Run this one. It should spin up. Hopefully it's not full of my, connect, my connection stream. There we go. Hello config DD 2021. I can now go back at some point because our, our requirements has changed. I'm going to edit that one. Press two. There we go. And if my code was that if I'd actually got the particular piece of magic in place, then in about 10 seconds it should update itself. It won't because I put it wrong. I've not missed I've missed a line somewhere. If we just restart it, a little behind the curtain, nothing happened. Second time we start, we get the update. That's a huge feature. That's a huge thing that you can take to your um, product owner and say, hey, we need to do a good thing. And we're doing that. We're doing exactly that. We're solving problems using new technology and by bringing it all in, we're refreshing the code base, simplifying it, man managing it. So I said at the top, there was all sorts of other lurking horrors <coughs> in, this code, in this code base. There are just too many to even start with. There was a handcrafted secure web protocol that used shared encryption keys and table database. It's kind of like, a, oh, let's rewrite our data but with our own encryption thing around it. The, the one of, with least impact on the code, but biggest impact on the developers was an inverted classic C cell naming. Everything was C because it's class, WF because it's Windows Forms, and then something. And that, and the, the descriptive name was always reversed. So if we had a, um, a fax file watcher, which watches for fax, for files going in that need to be faxed or that have come from a fax service, this is legacy, remember, that would have been called CWF client file watcher fax. And that's everywhere, that was horrible. There was file based logging, yeah, okay, traditional, stick it on the file system, nice and simple, but there were at least three implementations. And there was usually two or three abstract, um, abstractions over the implementations as well. Simple solution, replace with Microsoft data extension sort logging everywhere. Horrible, but it has, it has to be done. And the benefit is then we took it to App Insights. We started logging to App Insights and within a week, found five bugs that no one had ever seen before. Because whilst they've been logged to the file system, because they've been suppressed and never affected the user, visually, they did internally, no one knew about them. Suddenly you get a huge amount of power in terms of seeing what's going on. And those are just three of the, the horrors in that lurking, uh, in that code base. All of which are being addressed, we'll get there in the end. So at 45 minutes, 
how hard can it be? It's just changing a button. This is where we came in. <clears throat> and actually, it isn't necessarily that hard. There's just potentially quite a lot of work to do. And you need to address, address that in a very cons constrained and thoughtful order. You've got to spot the symptoms. You've got to understand what the red flags are that things are likely to be difficult. You've got to feel confident in refactoring all over the shop. This may mean you actually need to write a shed load of unit tests before you actually start refactoring. So going back to that scripting um, engine, where there was a class in there that was nearly 50,000 lines long that had a 1200 line long switch statement in it. Refactoring that is an ongoing process because for every entry in that switch statement, we should just basically, if it's this type of message, send it to this type of handler. It was straightforward, but we had to write a load of tests for every single handler to prove what they actually did before we could refactor them out. This actually ultimately will be a horrible laborious process is really, really good because we found we found bugs in that part of the code base that no one had ever seen before. Again, and as they come out of the switch statement and go into a very simple function map, performance of that script handle is very slowly increasing because switch statements ultimately iterate through every statement looking to see for a match. The map was much faster. But you've got to understand the history of the code base there. Well, don't just swear at it, but spot the patterns good and bad. Actually, sometimes you'll find a to do that tells you exactly what was there. That switch statement at the top of it had remove this switch statement in favor of a mapping function because the switch statement will become non performant. Someone had thought about it right up front, but they never had the opportunity to take that one little piece of work to refactor it out before it became 1,000 or 1,200 lines of code. The other thing is try and spot a big reward for what you're doing in terms of refactoring and enhancing this code base. Yes, you can just polish and make it nice, which has a reward in that supportability and maintainability is improved. But if you can find big wins, using App Insights means you find bugs. Using dependency injection means you remove the God objects and remove Let's get some more bugs that were, were there. Try and target those maximum rewards because that's your dangling carrot to get the work done. We're at 48 minutes. I'll see, anyone got any questions? Nigel, anything? Don't see anything particularly question wise in the um, Discord. No, but uh, this was a really good session. I, I, I relate to it a lot. I have exactly the same problem. I think everyone relates to this at some point. I mean, this this kind of thing is not a it's not a you know here's something really new. It isn't really new, but it's a matter of you've got to look at where your code base is, where it's come from, and then how can you just do these little advances that when you put them all together give you the big wins. Do you keep a blog of of these uh, things or? So the bit, so our bit, our development process, um, each of these refactorings generally um, comes out of either a a feature, i.e. a code change that we were a code change in the code because of a feature, and hence it was it's more it's efficient for us to do this in order to implement this feature or because we've found it to do stuff or whatever, and we've actually created a tech debt PBI. Um, so there was an earlier session uh, in, a, in the, the architecture track um, where, yes, it was uh, Tony Dang's session where he talks about all the different types of technical debt. Um, and approaches to them. And one of the things he says is if you create tech debt tickets, then one, you've got visibility with your product ownership. 
and two, you can actually size them um, and then put them into the program so they don't get forgotten and do get done. And that works. We use exactly that same process um, at Landmark in, the, in this legacy product to make sure we don't lose this. And it's a slow process, but it is proving really valuable to get there. Well, if there's no other questions from you, Nigel, or from anyone on the Discord, I'll just, just say thank you very much. Um, thanks for attending DDD remotely. It'll be nice to actually get it uh, in real life, hopefully next year. Um, any problem, uh, my contact details are here if you want to get in touch with me. Twitter's usually the best one. Um, just thank you for attending. Thank you for listening. Hope it was useful. Uh, I am going to be releasing the YouTube video, so expect that in a few days or a couple of weeks' time. Um, again, thanks for coming, and I'll give you back another five minutes of your life. Thank you. <laughs>